Hi everybody and thank you again for watching another episode of Gaffer and Gear. Today it's another gear review. We're having a look at the Godox NoLED F600 by 600 watt of bicolor LED mat in a 4x4 fixture and it packs down into a bag this small. Alright, so I'm going to start this review off in a bit of a weird place if you're not a gaffer, but if you're a gaffer I think you're going to absolutely appreciate where I'm coming from and putting this detail up the front. Alright, so this thing is 600 watt, it can light up a large area, that's a lot of firepower, 600 watt. But here's what we know is going to happen, a cinematographer is going to look at this and go, Oh, what a beautiful broad light source for interviews. Let's stick this right on the very edge of shot so it wraps beautifully around our actor's face or our presenter's face. And my concern was 600 watt, that's like a nuclear bomb going off in that sort of scenario. Um, you know, I've, I've constantly got lights running at less than 1%. So my initial concern was, how does this thing go at its lowest value that I can dial in? Can I still use it as a key light? Do I still get good color render? So let's take a look at the results for that testing. Okay, so let's have a look at the dimming characteristics at 3200 Kelvin first. I've taken readings at 100%, 50%, 25%, 10%, 5%, 1%, 1% and 0.1%. As you can see, given the amount of dimming range, the CCT is very consistent. Across the entire range, it has a color render score of 96, and that's using TM30RF as a reference. At 100% brightness, the light is a little bit towards magenta, by about roughly the equivalent of two thirds of a 1 8th correction gel. But overall, there's very minimal shift. All the way down at 0.1%, it comes in with a plus 0.009 which would give it an imperceivable green hue to roughly the equivalent of one third of a one eighth correction gel. Now let's take a look at 5,600 Kelvin. And again, given the extent of the dimming range here, the CCT is very consistent. The color render score does drop from 95 down to 94, but only at 0.1%. And the white point or color hue is extremely consistent right across this range. Now the thing that's really surprised me is even down at 0.1%, I can't get any flicker. According to my frequency meter, this light is using a mixture of dimming systems. At 100%, 75%, 50%, and 25% brightness, my meter indicates consistent light output, as in no frequency at all. From 10% and below, it seems to be running at about a 20 kilohertz scattered pulse width modulation. Okay, so before we get too much further into the episode, just something I want to point out. This handle here is not actually part of the light. The mount on the light is a junior slash baby pin mount, and this is a clamp that is designed to attach lights like this to the stand. It is not actually part of the light, so just ignore it when you see it. All right, let's get into the negatives and get those out of the way. Now, despite this being their flagship brand, it does not have built-in CRMX. I found that quite surprising. Now, the light does have built-in DMX, which is very good for setting your levels and setting your CCT, but I wouldn't call it queuable. So if you want to see how it queues, uh, have a look at that testing later on in the episode. The next negative for me, or possible negative for people, is because it has an exterior frame, it's going to take a bit longer to set up than, say, a light mat product if you're building it completely from scratch. The next negative for me is the head lead. Now this won't be a negative for everybody, but it might be for some people. All right, so at the moment, I am not running a head lead to it, and there is plenty of uh, length on the cable supplied that's attached to the head that you could have the controller on the ground and have this at, say, interview height, for example. Now with the supplied head lead, you can easily get up to the top of a 12 foot light stand, no problem at all. But if you're going to be using this on a menace arm, I have found this to be that little bit irritatingly too short. It could be do it could do it being maybe another two or three meters longer, but they do sell additional head leads now. So obviously people have complained about that. All right, the last negative for me is the controller is not weather resistant, but the head is. I find that a little bit strange that make the head weather resistant, but not the controller. And the last negative for me, and this is a negative with a lot of brands, it is supplied with a control grid, but the grid, in my opinion, doesn't do a good enough job of containing the beam. Now let's cover some of the things that are neither pros nor cons, but some people are going to want to know about. The size of the mat is just a little bit too small to mount onto a standard 4x4 blade frame, which is just a little bit frustrating, isn't it guys? 
All right, the next possible con for people might be the connection point on the power cable here where it, where it connects to the mount. It is not centralized, so it can throw it off balance a little bit. If you're on a light stand or something like that, it's no big deal, but if you're on a menace arm, it's just something to be aware of, okay? Just make sure you've got everything nice and tight on that arm so it doesn't slip. And the last possible negative for people is it only comes with the one flavor of diffuser, which is a grid cloth. I'm guessing about a half grid cloth. For me, this does do a good all round job though. All right, so let's talk about the pros now. The dimming characteristics are superb. The color render is also superb. It packs down into a relatively small form factor. Its user interface is really easy to use. It has a lot of output. You could use it without the diffuser and it's still a usable light. And finally, the price point. So let's talk about how much it costs and what you get for your money. Okay, so let's go through what you get. All right, so the kit comes in this beautiful, big, well, constructed sturdy bag and the bag has a few other smaller bags inside it to keep everything nice and neat all right so you get your instruction manual you get your regional power cable which has a nutrix connector at one end and this is a decent cable it's not made of that pvc rubbish you get a head lead which has nice industrial connectors on it and you also get the controller now the controller has the power supply built in now the controller is not weather resistant but it does have a v-mount capability on the sides ready to go now in terms of the battery options you can run it off a single 14.8 volt battery at a maximum 20 percent brightness you could also run it off a single 26 volt battery at a maximum 30 percent brightness two 14.8 volt batteries for a maximum 40% brightness. You could do a combination of a 26 volt and a 14.8 volt for 50% brightness. And two 26 volt batteries would get you up to 60% brightness. Okay, the next thing is another bag which holds your frame kit in it. Now I've already taken the liberty of building the center part of the frame just to save a bit of time with explaining. But this is the outside of the frame. Take a look at this for a good design. Okay, how beautiful is that? All right, so I'll spin this around so you can see it a little bit better. All right, so you've got these uh, joiners here, which slide. So that just slides across and lock. Do the same on the opposite side. So slide that across, stops the hinge from folding in, and then lock it down. Now your other two hinges here, which move, once you put your center in and lock that into place, that'll stop those hinges from folding. Now, the next thing in the bag is another bag and this bag contains the mat. All right, so underneath the flap here is another little compartment which can hold the head lead or the head lead that's connected to the mat at least so that you don't have the lead rubbing against the mat. All right, so let's get that out. Now the mat has eyelets all the way around the outside, so you don't necessarily have to mount it to the frame. You could mount it using the eyelets in any other way you see fit. Now you also get a whole heap of these bungee cord ball things. All right, so what I would suggest is um, when you're assembling this, this took you a little bit of time to figure this out, have the top row already in the mat, okay? So all you then have to do is hold the top row up and then feed the bungee cord around the frame and back around the ball. And that way, you've got all the hard work out of the way. Okay, so now we've got all the bungee cords on, the mat is securely held in place. And look, even pointing downwards, that's not gonna go anywhere, that's pretty secure. Now, at this point, because the mat has the weather protection on the front, that weather protection offers just enough diffusion over the LEDs that you could possibly use it at this point if you're in a hurry. Now, when you're running this through its CCTs, at no point do you have any individual color of LED running by itself. They're all running together, so you get a nice even distribution across the surface. Now, the next thing in the kit is the softbox. Now, the softbox mounts to the light via the Velcro on the back of the light, not on the front here. All right, so just a quick tip for new players. Took me a couple of goes to get this right. So on the softbox here, 
around the outside where the Velcro is, you've got these little gaps. That, that space there is for the bungee cable or bungee cord to go through. Now you wanna make sure that you've got that on the corners. Okay, if you don't have it on the corners, you're gonna to have to start again. All right, so let's put this on and see how we go. Now at this point, if you've got a friend, it would be very, very helpful. But if you're alone like me, well, it could take you a few minutes longer. Now I've got the box on, it is worth pointing out that the edges of the box here do have some snap spine to them to give you that little bit more support with your diffuser so it doesn't sag like it does on a lot of other soft boxes. Now in terms of diffusers, you get the one diffuser, which is a grid cloth and it's at least a half strength grid cloth. Now the last thing supplied in the kit is a grid and the grid has these little notches on it that let you know where the corners are so you can get them on nice and fast. Now let's have a look at an optional extra which will get a lot of you excited and that is the Pancake Lantern. All right, so Straight up, I can't find a listing for this anywhere. I've got no idea what the price is. It, it's all over their websites as an optional extra, but I can't find any actual link to it. So hopefully they sort that out soon. Now, it's made with a grid cloth material. You definitely can't see the LEDs inside. In terms of a negative, it doesn't come with any skirt, but you could make up your own skirt and attach it to the metal frame easy enough, you know, just using some black material. In terms of how easy this is to assemble, I spent longer looking for the instruction manual that doesn't exist than it took me to assemble it. All right, so in the center here, you've got this uh, cross piece, because I've got two of these lanterns. So you've got this cross piece here, and you've got four rods, which then just simply go into the cross piece as easy as that, even easier if you don't need glasses and you can see what you're doing. And uh, then your rods, essentially, they just go through loops here into the corner of the lantern and the lantern then simply Velcros onto the back of the light. Easy as that. All right, let's have a look at how the light performs with and without the different accessories. Now let's have a look at the light with no diffuser attached. As you can see here, the weather protection does offer a little bit of diffusion which does help to merge everything together as one light source, given that you're far enough away. And just for your reference, the light here is set to 5,600 Kelvin. Now I'm gonna put it at its top Kelvin, 8,500, and see if that affects the shadows or the beam angle at all. Now let's have a look at 3,200 Kelvin. And this is 2700 Kelvin, the lowest CCT. As you can see, it is still a very soft light source, even without the diffuser. But you can get some shadow echo, which will be noticeable on really fine shadows. Now let's take a look with the supplied diffusion on. And as you would expect, this just gives a massive soft spread. The results are the same regardless of the CCT that you dial in. And of course, the shadow qualities on a light source this broad are going to be very soft. Next, let's try this with the supplied grid. And for me, the cell walls here are either not long enough or the cells are too big. Now, it has definitely reduced the beam angle. It looks more like the beam angle that I'd get off a two by one soft light. and the shadow qualities haven't changed that much. 
Now let's take a look with the gigantic lantern on. And just for reference, all of my brightness readings are measured out from what I'm going to call the nipple. Now up until this test, I'd only ever thought about using a lantern facing downwards, but this could come in handy lighting up a large area. And again, very soft shadows. Okay, let's start off the DMX testing. The Godox F600 Bi is running off an 8-bit CCT profile. It has its dimmer set to linear. As far as I can tell, there are no smoothing options. And it is receiving its commands via an external CRMX receiver, which is actually a Godox optional extra. To give you something to compare it to, I have a Titan tube, which is also receiving its commands via CRMX. It is set to an 8-bit CCT profile, and it is set to its default standard dimmer curve. Let's start off the testing with instant on-off commands. Now let's have a look at some half-second cues. Now for some one second cues. Now for some two and a half second cues. And now for some five second cues. Now let's have a look at some CCT changeovers between 5600 Kelvin and 3200 Kelvin, starting with instant changeovers. Now for some half second changeovers. Now for some one second changeovers. Now for some two and a half second changeovers. And now for some five second changeovers. Okay, let's start going through the rest of the data I've collected on the unit, starting off with the maximum AC power draw. The maximum power draw recorded over several days of testing was 643.8 watt. At 3200 Kelvin, it's pulling 635 watt, and at 5600 Kelvin, it's pulling 639 watt. Now let's take a look at the average CCT accuracies, and these are taken with the diffuser attached. 
Now let's take a look at the TM30 RF color render scores. And this is where this light really heroes. Between 2700 to 3400 Kelvin, it comes in with an impressive 96. And from 3500 all the way up to 6700 Kelvin, it's scoring 95. Now let's have a look at our white point placement, color hue or delta UV. Now I'm not giving any averages because this light is bicolor, so it doesn't track to the Planckian or daylight curve. At its lowest Kelvin of 2700, it has a green hue to slightly more than the equivalent of a 1 8 correction gel. At roughly 3000 Kelvin, it crosses the Planckian curve. At 3200 Kelvin, the light has a slight magenta hue to roughly the equivalent of 2 thirds of a 1 8 correction gel. At 4000 Kelvin, the light is the most it ever gets under the Planckian curve. Now the light hits the Planckian curve once again at 5600 Kelvin, and at 8500 Kelvin, its top CCT, it's the most it's ever above the Planckian curve with a delta UV of plus 0.0072. Okay, let's take a closer look at some of our CCTs now, starting off with the lowest Kelvin that we can dial in. When I dialed in 2700 Kelvin, I got 2870. The TN30 color render results were 96% average color accuracy with an average 101% color saturation. With the CRI scores, R12 is only just below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point comes in with a delta UV of plus 0.0028, which would give it a slight green hue to roughly the equivalent of a 1 8 correction gel. When I dialed in 3200 Kelvin, I got 3319 with an SSI score of 84. The TM30 color render results were 96% average color accuracy with an average 103% color saturation. With the CRI scores, R12 is only just below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point comes in with a delta UV of minus 0.0016 which would give the light at this point a slight magenta hue to roughly the equivalent of two thirds of a 1 8 correction gel. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, I got 4,601. The TN30 color render results were 95% average color accuracy with an average 104% color saturation. With the CRI scores, R9 and R12 are below 90. This is a spectrum distribution. And the white point comes in with a delta UV of minus 0.0033, which is pretty typical of a bicolor light at this point. When I dialed in 5600 Kelvin, I got 5791 with an SSI score of 74. The TN30 color render results were 95% average color accuracy with an average 103% color saturation. With the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point comes in with a delta UV of minus 0.0001, which places it almost smack on top of the Planckian curve. But if your camera is working to the daylight curve, that would make this light slightly magenta to roughly the equivalent of a 1 8 correction gel. Now I've taken some readings at 6,500, 7,000, 7,500 and 8,000 Kelvin. When I dialed in the top CCT of 8,500, I got 8,633. The TN30 color render results are still a respectable 93% average color accuracy with an average 99% color saturation. With the CRI scores, R9, R10 and R12 are all below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And as you'd expect with a bicolor light with a CCT this high, it has quite a green hue with a delta UV of plus 0.0072. All right, so just my closing thoughts on this unit. The biggest thing I don't like about it is the fact it doesn't come with a decent grid. If it came with a decent grid or a lighting control device on the front, that'd be fantastic for interviews. Um, I can't see the point in having a weather resistant mat and not having a weather resistant controller. For me, I think it would have been my preference if they didn't have the weather protection on the mat, which made it lighter weight, that would have been more beneficial to me. Um, I'm not so much bummed out that the thing does not have green magenta correction or RGB capability, because if you add all that stuff into a mat, that's more LEDs and those LEDs need wiring, the mat starts to become very heavy. Um, no built-in CRMX, I think that's a bit of an oversight on their professional brand, but the dongle is fairly cheap. Look, if I buy a second one, I'm definitely going to team it up um, with the Lantern. I think that's a, a, going to be a bit of a no-brainer for the average gaffer. And look, I think the big winner for this is the price point. If you're a, 
a gaffer starting out or owner operator starting out and you're looking for a 4x4 mat, this is really hard to go past for the price and for the quality that you get.